All right, buckle up for some wild tales from the pawn shop universe. A dude walks in trying to return a wonky iPhone, swearing he got it from here. Plot twist, no receipt, and he even tried blaming a random worker. Now that's just the tip of the iceberg. We've got ladies claiming purse hostage situations and others pulling broken TV emotional sagas. Here are the scammers being caught on Hardcore Pawn. This dude who gets totally jacked in Detroit loses everything, even his watch. So he hits up this pawn shop to sell some stuff and make his way back to sunny California. Good, man. I'm Les. Philip, nice to meet you, sir. I'm here from California to do some construction, you know, buy some homes. Made a wrong turn, got robbed. And everything, dude, all uh, my cash. I got nothing left, dude. I got a watch. I'm trying to get some money so I can sure. get back to California. Les hears the guy's sob story, feels some sympathy, and offers 80 bucks for the watch. Not a fortune, but the guy was probably expecting pocket change, so not bad, right? How much did you need? Three, four hundred bucks just to get on a plane or a bus. He brought me in a watch, a good brand, but it wasn't worth the kind of money that he was asking for. Well, the bad news is those aren't diamonds in it. What do you mean? It's glass. No. Yeah. No way. I can go 80 bucks. But no, our hero feels insulted, thinks his watch is gold or something. He's like, bro, normally I get 500 bucks for this watch and you're offering me 80? Rip off. Normally we go 50, but I'm gonna give you 80 because I like your story. Les isn't budging though, he's standing firm at $80. Now the guy's boiling, calls Les and everyone in the shop garbage. Like my story? So getting robbed is a good story. No. I came yeah, over here to Detroit good. and you guys robbed me. I didn't rob you. You might as well have. You're trying to give me 80 bucks for my watch. How the is that not robbing me? You get $30 more than we normally go. Detroit, man. This ain't gonna happen in Orange County, man. People who are here are garbage, and you're garbage, man. The scene kicks off with Grandma storming into the pawn shop, demanding her money back for a purse that she claims is fake. Now she's not holding back, loudly insisting on a refund while the audience can't help but applaud her fiery entrance. You don't want to mess with a grandma on a mission, so she demands to restore her sense of humor before anything else happens. She insists on getting her money back, saying that the purse she purchased was just as phony as a $3 bill. Ma'am, do you have the receipt? I didn't give you a second when I gave you my money. Ma'am, I'm trying not to really You took my control. money and I won't. Show me the receipt. I don't have a receipt. You sold me this purse. Baloney. So when did you buy it? I bought it a week ago. Les tries to maintain his cool amidst Grandma's escalating tantrum. Now he asks for the receipt, but Grandma didn't expect that curveball. Now she intensifies her demand for a refund, saying she isn't playing games with her hard-earned money, even without a receipt in hand. Now Les's justifications aren't going to hold water with her. She wants her money, and she wants it now. From me. From you. This is tarnished. You know what that stands for? What, what is that? I want my money. There will be. Don't put your hands on me. No Ma'am, there will be no smoking no in the store. store. No smoking in the store. I got to call my nose. I'm not putting my cigarette out. Put your cigarette out. Get your hands off me. Put your cigarette out, miss. Miss, come here. Get your hands put off me. I'm not. Just when you think the situation can't get any more ridiculous, Grandma takes out her cigarette and lights up in the store. Les, however, ain't having any of that and warns her right away that smoking isn't permitted anywhere, especially in his store. Grandma, however, is in no mood to follow the rules, leading to a showdown where Les tries to put out her cigarette while she vehemently refuses. I'm bending over backwards to appease this granny. Oh, I'm dear. trying to be professional give and I'm trying to give you courtesy. Give me my money. That's all I want is my money. As the literal smoke clears, Grandma's still not backing down. She demands her money with a threat of legal action, insisting that she'll see Les in court. Les, exasperated, finally agrees to give her the refund just to get her out of his hair. But even as he tries to make things right, Grandma ain't done. She wants a card because she's ready to sue his butt. And with that threat hanging in the air, she finally storms out, leaving Les bewildered and relieved. All I want is my money. Give me your card, because I'm going to sue your ass. Okay, I'll see you in court. Goodbye. Get your hands off me. 
Go ahead. Whatever. She does not remind me of my grandmother. And just when Les thinks the ordeal's over, Grandma turns back with one final threat. She's going to bust his window. Now Les tries to reason with her, but Grandma's not having it. She's ready to throw down. But Les, with a mix of frustration and amusement, challenges her to try. And as she storms out for the last time, Les can't help but reflect on how she's nothing like his own grandma, leaving the audience in stitches at the absurdity of it all. And that's it for today. Thanks for being a part of the Hardcore Pond adventure with us. We hope you like the drama and surprises. And make sure you stay tuned for more Pawn Shop stories. See you next time. Watch Les the Pawn Shop Detective figure out a mystery with messy DJs and laptops held captive. See the suspenseful investigation unfold right here. Laugh and cringe as a shouting woman causes trouble in the pawn shop, making Seth and Les really mad. Then a guard shows up and there's a surprising twist outside. Okay, I went to get my purse back to make my payment. She's telling me this is expired. That's my purse right there. That one right there, black one. The meticulous lady strides in armed with confidence in a fake receipt, proclaiming ownership of a purse. Little does she know that Ashley is the store's memory bank, fully aware of every item in its rightful place. The girl in her eagerness attempts to vault over the counter, unaware that Ashley, the guardian of scams, is on duty. It's my purse right there. How do you know that's your purse? Because I know my purse. Here's the money. I want the purse. That bag was never in pawn. If you want to buy it, I just want to look at it and make sure it's not mine. Undeterred by gravity and common sense, the girl persists in her charade. However, Ashley stands firm, recognizing the futility of the scam and the level of wrongness involved. It's like trying to sneak a peek at the answer key when the teacher is watching. Yeah, that's not happening. I'm not First of all, don't talk to me like I'm an idiot. You. Give me my purse or I'm going to come over that counter and get it myself. Oh my god. Get your hands off me. Have a nice day. Let's go. Walk yeah. yourself out, yeah. you. Walk. With a swift resolution to this failed escapade, the girl finds herself unceremoniously escorted out of the store. Line. Fifty dollars less. Shake on it. Give me a minute. No problem. You got an ad you can show me? Oh, I got you. This young punk comes in thinking that he's gonna get one over on me. Does he not know who he's dealing with? Thank you very much. It's me. Twelve dollars. He ate me alive. Shannon's fur coat fiasco at the pawn shop where bargaining hits a snag and tensions soar, it's clear that negotiating prices can be as wild as a fox in a hen house. Do you have anything else? No. Excuse me? No. God damn it. Tell him his name. Don't put your hands on that woman. Your mama is a fool. Les Gold faces off with a cheerful, plump customer aiming to sell a watch for his wife's anniversary. Les, ever witty, discovers it's their anniversary too. The old man deadpans 25 years, prompting Les to hilariously inquire, How many happy years, man? Laughter ensues in this pawn shop comedy. Have your day. Ooh, have a nice day. Ah, <sighs> boo. Hey, Detroit. We're headed to the dream cruise. I need the pun, please. Okay, let's take a look at it. Okay. I'm here with my man. He got in a big argument and left me, so I need to he get back home. He left you here? Oh, yeah, he left me, and I got to get back. Back where? To Hawaii. In this funny scene at a pawn shop, the person in charge, Les, like a boss, looks at a watch and says, it's fake, not real. This surprises our customer, who looks sad like a puppy, but he doesn't give up. He tries to make a deal, asking how much they'll pay for the supposedly fake watch, but the pawn shop owner isn't interested and won't pay anything for it. They only think that all? Really? Okay, how much did you need? I was just trying to not this for you to be nice, but. 600. How'd you come up with that? I got this from one of my aunts in Africa. This is $600. Do you know what it is? It's an African pearl. That's what it is. Is it actually a Tahitian pearl? No, this is from Africa. This is an African pearl. This is a customer who's a bit overweight and acts really strange. He starts making crazy threats and saying weird stuff about the pawn shop owner's wife. This makes Les mad and everything gets really chaotic like a crazy carnival. Then out of nowhere, security guards show up and grab our main character. They kick him out of the shop. Pearls. Tahitian pearls are Okay, back. so how much is it worth? It's gonna be under 600. My ticket costs 600, that's how much I need. Do you have anything else? No. Excuse me? No. 
You I told me I wasn't is. going fast enough. Did you call me a bitch? Okay. Exactly. Can I get $600 no, or not? You can't get anything. Okay. You can't talk to her like this. Who do you think you, you are coming over the... You're not can anybody. Can I get $597? Why get... oh, he left you now? You don't know why the f*** he left you. No, he left No, I f***ed her. I'm not leaving no more place. Yes, you are. Talk to us like a human being. They think that. Discussing his new responsibility of pricing items for sale.
He reveals his discovery of a framed item, initially estimating its value at 100 bucks, and mentions its significance as an original piece by Stanley Mouse, known for his work with The Grateful Dead and other bands. We'll do some investigation and find out. This is it? Yeah, that's it, right there, the mouse. Wow. That's not a mark. Stanley Mouse did The Grateful Dead, he did a lot of... A yeah, I see that. Post. I think I actually have somebody that might buy this. Really? I think so. He collects a lot of this this kind of stuff. Go sell it. Well, I told them, the stranger the item, the more value it had. The pricing owner and Les delve into the potential worth of the item, recognizing its rarity and connection to Stanley Mouse. They discuss the value of unique items, citing examples like an old hand-painted t-shirt that turned out to be valuable. The pricing owner expresses intention to find a suitable buyer for the item. Uh, an original Stanley Mouse painting. I don't have any originals. I'm sorry. What's happening, John? Thanks for calling me, man. Not a problem, but I'll, I'll bring it up. Give me one second. I have a couple of his prints at my house, but I don't have anything that's original like that. Well, that's as original as it gets. What's well, a ticket on this, Barry? 3000 Three grand, huh? It's the one and only. It's the one and only. It's loud. I mean, you're like the first person that's seen it. It's nice. I yeah. thought about it. Yeah. 22. For an old friend. How old is he? He's pretty old. Rich, the potential buyer, presents the original Stanley Mouse painting to the pricing owner. They discuss its uniqueness and negotiate the price, ultimately settling on $2,200 after initial suggestions of $3,000. The pricing owner acknowledges the rarity of the piece and agrees to the deal. $2,200? Gonna take it with you? Right now. You got a deal. $2,200. Thank you very much. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. I'll help you hang that up. $2,200. That's a great deal for him. I made, I thought it was just another stupid purchase, but I'm mad enough to admit it. He killed on this one. Props to my dad. They also thank Rich for helping make it happen. Les, the owner, also joins in and says that they're impressed with how things turned out and that the person who set the price did a great job. Are you, are you her customer or mine? I'm talking to you. Come on. This lady got so irate because she wanted to be next in line. She wanted to be first. She felt that she was the most important out of every customer. You're next in line, so I'm going to be right with you. Okay, well, come on. It doesn't matter. What the f are you? You're not the police. I can talk to whoever the f I want to talk to. How the what are you going to do? You offer it now. In the opening scene, Ashley is at the counter with a lengthy line of customers. A sudden disruption occurs when a black woman attempts to cut in front of everybody else. Ashley confronts her, asking, what are you doing? The woman becomes upset, but Ashley firmly asserts you can't do that stuff here goodbye yeah, come back here let's talk right now take the receipt. what would you like to do with it ma'am i want to pay well you have to go to those windows i'm not no i come to this line any other time not at this window okay well i'm not gonna stand in the uh, line in the wrong line get in the okay, other line and i'm not gonna I'm, get in another line i'm gonna walk straight up to the damn window we won't take the woman continued standing in line at the counter Alessa approached her inquiring about the situation she explained that she wanted to pay but refused refused to move to the next window. Les informed her that in the pawn shop, crossing others in line isn't allowed, emphasizing the importance of waiting your turn. Here of you. Well, see this lady here? All the other customers. Okay, did I always come to this one? I'm sorry, you have to stand in the other one. Okay, well, I'll be back before y'all close. You can do whatever you want in this line. She can. Can't wait your turn. We'll be back later. Following the interaction, the woman eventually complied and moved to another window. Les, taking action, instructed the workers at that window not to accept their payment. He firmly directed the woman to wait in line like the other customers, reinforcing the shop's policy on fair and orderly transactions. Thank you, sir. We you know, appreciate no, you. No, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, jackass. Take your Take bitch. Take yeah, bitch. that's you. And get it. You. you make me, make we don't, sir. We don't want this. You can take this stuff, sir. And sir, put it with listen, good, don't shag. listen. I don't know what the problem was. As the interaction begins, the customer expresses gratitude, but the tone takes an unexpected turn. Tensions rise as the customer's language becomes confrontational. The shopkeeper, addressing the situation calmly, refuses to tolerate mistreatment. The dynamics shift from appreciation to conflict showcasing the challenges of customer service in a brief yet intense moment. Came in here, tried to spend my money, is what I did. That's what I did. Okay. And come, instead of trying to come in here, I'm not even talking to you. I need a, need a liver transplant. Why? Seriously? They didn't even look at these cards. Sour Patch Kids. 
The narrative unfolds with the arrival of another customer, visibly intoxicated. The shopkeeper navigates the encounter with a mix of tolerance and assertiveness. The customer attempts to engage in banter, revealing signs of alcohol influence. The shopkeeper, unswayed, maintains composure and subtly addresses the situation, highlighting the challenges of dealing with individuals under the influence. Jeff, take him out, please. How would you Man. Man, what the In this segment, a discussion ensues about cards and a potential liver transplant. The shopkeeper encounters a situation where the customer's intentions are unclear. Misunderstandings arise and the shopkeeper skillfully navigates the conversation. The dialogue touches on humorous elements while portraying the complexity of communication in a retail setting. What is it, ma'am? Uh, is it? I don't know. You tell me. Man, come on, you the dude with the ponytail? The wife's racking my nuts on the ponytail. Just tie two earrings in your Doesn't ears. Matter. Does it matter? Just take it off, put it with mine a little bit, let it get a little bit more weight to it, and go ahead and give me my okay. money. Does that make sense? No, right no. this way. Man, you can't come back. Damn now. this! Go out my way, man! Why do y'all touch me? I'll break this. I'm more than happy to go to the ends of the earth for you. When you come in like an ass, you be walked out like an ass. The scene takes a surprising turn as the atmosphere shifts. The shopkeeper reassures the customers that, despite challenges, the store is dedicated to going the extra mile for them. The encounter, starting with tension, concludes with an assurance of excellent service. This final part encapsulates the roller coaster of emotions within a brief time frame, showcasing the highs and lows of customer interactions. Nikki's got this customer who's upset about the cash offered for her golden bracelet. Uh, they usually give me three. Okay, gold drops, so uh, that's not my problem. She start she expected $300 like last time, but Nikki says it's $250 now because the gold price did a little dance. She started clamoring for a manager over and over, like that was going to solve anything. I want to speak to your manager. What price did you give her? $250. And you need how much? Three. Okay. Just because the price of gold has gone down, that's... Now, this customer isn't having it. She's like, I want a manager. But surprise, Ashley steps in. Not a manager, but trying to explain the gold market. The customer's having none of it and wants that extra 50 bucks. Not understanding. No, I want my $50. The extra $50. If you want to no, give me my extra $50, come on! Since it's clear she won't be getting the amount she was hoping for, she decides when she realizes that bonus cash isn't happening, the customer flips the script, blaming the gold price drop for her unhappiness. She's dead set on getting her money despite market facts. Hey. Gold has gone down. Give me my money. Is she serious? Yeah. You had to bring him around because you sick. But Nikki's had enough of the drama. She tells the customer to hit the road, saying disruptive behavior isn't cool. And well, she's not welcome anymore. Customers out, never to return. Here. Have a good day. Oh, and walk I ain't never coming back to this store. You ain't big. Have a good day. Have a good you day. ain't big. No, I will day. drop you. Have a good day. A young man from Dallas walks in, all proud of the watch that his grandma gave him, thinking it's worth 500 bucks. But Les takes a look and points out some issues, saying it's not worth much. A man from Dallas walks in. <laughs> what you got here? A watch my grandmother gave me. Uh-huh. And how much did you want? Uh, I'm trying to get 500 The guy's not having it. He wants to talk to someone who knows their stuff. Yeah, you see these, this discoloration on the side? No. Rose color metal in there looks like copper. I see gold. But it's not gold. I wouldn't be able to take it. Can't give me nothing. Les tries to reassure him, but things go south. The guy's all frustrated, claiming his watch is worth 500 bucks, demanding to talk to the jeweler. Sorry. Can I talk to somebody that knows what they're doing? You can talk to me. Les, you're both me, man. I have to get home, man, this week. I understand that but it's got no value. It does have value. Things begin to go south. This is a bunch of bull man. I want to pawn my watch that's worth $500. Let me tell you, have you talked to my Jew? 
Now, when the jeweler says it's basically worthless, things get wild. The guy goes off, and before you know it, he's getting escorted outside unceremoniously. Well, this guy's been in the jewelry business all of his life. He wants a $500 loan on a watch. What can you do with him? What are we doing? Well, I wouldn't really call him names. We're not calling you any names. You Outside, he's still fuming, dropping some colorful words. It's a full-blown scene at the pawn shop. The guy wants his watch back, but Les isn't having it. Nothing. Stop being a bitch. This is the worst pawn shop in the city. It's a piece of shit, dude. Give me my mother man. Come over here and pick this bitch up. Yo, you. Get him here. Let's go, my man. You got Jimmy, my The buddy. Pull your job. Hands off. Yes, sir. Hey, yo. A customer eager to test the bike's functionality pushed to take it for a spin right inside the store. North power I got. A lot. 600 cc's, my man. Seth, smelling something fishy, hesitates but agrees to check it outside. The customer, though, pushes to ride it down the road, making Seth suspicious of his motives. It's just pretty wild. I don't see what it's got. Can I get the keys? I want to see if it starts. I'm not turning it on in here, but if you want, we can take it outside. Now, it's clear that this customer might have some sketchy plans. Seth, playing it smart, doesn't let the guy take control of the bike. Faith in a person he just met. You can't let me take the bike down the road. Now, the customer, thinking that he's all tough, brings in a friend, calling him his dog, trying to challenge Seth's authority. Let's try it out. Who's this guy? That's my dog. That's your dog? That's my dog. But guess what? Seth's got backup. Byron and the crew. Byron is known for his muscles ready to keep the peace. The customer, yeah, feeling overconfident, tries to provoke Byron, but it backfires big time. Byron takes charge and kicks him out. Understand? Why? You got somebody's gonna stop me? Byron. Come on. Man, I don't need your dog. Come on, dog. You get over here and take care of this light work. Byron's big presence shows that loud barks don't always mean a big bite. The troublemakers learn the hard way that messing with Byron is a bad idea. Oh. Don't know where it from. It don't Step matter where I'm from, you man. You stay the, the out of right. my face. That's all I can tell you. I'm sure you whose face I'm getting. This your dog, right? No, you get up my face. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Drama in the store, and Byron's not having any of it. These motherfuckers. I guess I had a big bark and a big bite. Because I pushed both of them out of the. It's time for a showdown as the customer's all worked up about his busted lounger from the shop and he wants his money back. But surprise, he didn't keep the receipt. Money back? Ab lounger I bought here, man, workout. Now, this thing obviously couldn't handle what I was doing on it. So, two days later, it only works. Let's lay it out. No receipt, no refund. But this customer's not having it. He's all about the money, not interested in an exchange, and things get loud. Security's on standby necessary to keep the receipt. I don't have a receipt. I didn't think I needed to keep it. There's nothing I can do for you without a receipt. If you had the receipt, I could give you an exchange. I could give you something. I don't want an exchange because it's probably going to be some again. How about you just get my money and then we won't, you know, we won't have any more problems with this. The customer keeps pushing, not caring about security or anything else. He's dead set on getting his money back, even throwing out threats. I need my mother money back. I'm not gonna do yes, anything. And like all this uh, That's security right. standing around or whatever. I don't give He's a rat's ass my... about that. There better be some money. When he sees security, he gets a bit jittery but doesn't back down, demanding even more backup. It's a feral showdown at the pawn shop. He reaches the point of no return. Oh, son. Come on. Come on, man. Let's go. Really? Let's go. Let's go. I told you, man. Son. We Come got on. you, buddy. Bring Let's a couple go. more. Come on. We got you. Bring a few. Yeah. The Gold family gets hit with a shocker when they catch their own employee, Christina, in a sneaky scheme. They're all curious about Christina's shady moves. Turns out she's been pulling off a scam right under their noses. During busy times, she's cooking up fake loan tickets, sneaking money from the pawn shop. The family's jaws drop. Total disbelief. At your merchandise. Yes. I wrote up the loan. Mm -hmm. Okay. I wrote it up, but I only did it when we were busy. So they confront Christina about it, and it's a mess. Her crafty plan makes it tough to figure out how much she stole. The numbers they're throwing around hint at thousands of dollars gone. Money off of them bit by bit. And so you, you wrote it up for 350 Yes. And what about this piece right here? How much did you give a loan on for? 
The Golds are just stunned at their own employees' audacity and cunning moves. Stolen. Would you wrote up a fake ticket and st well, keeping everything aside, this was indeed one of the craziest profits earned at Pawn Star Shop. Moving on, which has two heads. So what we got here is a Russian order, and that's what this medal represents. It's a piece of history that dates back 800 years. Pretty neat, huh? Well, neat in the sense of 800 years of Poland struggles, constantly being conquered, reconquered, and fighting for their freedom throughout their entire history. Users also shared how this whole episode reminded them of their beloved history classes back in their school days. It brought back memories of learning about the triumphs, tragedies, dramas, and even the occasional humor that filled those lessons. With the background story out of the way, Rick finally gets down to the burning question. What's the damn thing worth? Because obviously he bought it without knowing its worth. Okay, so we're talking about a medal of Fabergé quality here. Crazy enough to give Rick some hope. Sadly, Craig has some serious concerning news for him. Apparently, the market for this specific metal is pretty thin. I mean, he can't cash, but hey, Craig's always got a solution up his sleeve. So, he chopped to meet Rick and brought with him some exciting news. He got in contact with a guy in Germany who has a box for this metal, has the ribbon for it, and even the breast star. It's all part of a set, you see, but there's a big hole in the guy's box, specifically for the neck order and Craig just knew that he finally found a potential buyer for the medal, someone who needs to complete their set. Now both the parties are ready to strike a deal. One person made a comment praising the honesty of Craig, noting how he offered a price range for the medal that matched its actual value of $30,000 to $40,000. Despite knowing that Rick had only paid $6,000 for it, Craig could have easily offered a lower price, like $12,000, and made a huge profit. But instead, he respected Rick and still managed to make some money while being fair. Welcome to the channel, guys. Okay. Oh my god. Get your hands off. Blurry face guy. We'll buy this and pawn this and that and give you 350 total. Get set for a crazy moment in this pawn shop. The shopkeeper and a customer are going at it in a big argument, trying to make a deal or who knows what. But wait for it. Out of the blue, two dudes in fancy clothes with blurry faces bust in like old school detectives. The shopkeeper scratching his head, clueless, but here's the kicker. Those blurry face guys are undercover detectives on a secret mission. It's like a scene straight out of a comedy movie. The detectives have arrived. I need to tell them what's been happening and show them the evidence. Hold on to your laughter because this is pure comedy chaos. The second those detectives waltz in, the shopkeeper's freaking out like he's been caught selling magical beans or who knows what. These detectives are all business, channeling serious Sherlock vibes after an espresso overdose. They're tearing through the shop like treasure hunters on a caffeine high, checking random stuff and maybe on the hunt for hidden treasures. Meanwhile, the poor shopkeeper's sweating bullets, desperately trying to keep his cool. It's like a real-life comedy suspense show unfolding before your eyes. Get ready for the wild ride of the century. These detectives, giving their best modern-day Sherlock and Watson vibes, decide to ramp up the drama with technology. It resembles they're on an investigator show marathon watch as they jump into the security camera film. As they replay quick forward and focus on each problematic little hiding spot in the shop, envision some strong, thrilling music playing behind the scenes. An investigator story with an innovative turn will keep you as eager and anxious as ever. Do you think he was working with someone else? If he was, it could be anyone. Well, buckle up for the big reveal. The digital detectives uncover the mastermind. And guess who? It's our buddy Joe. Yep, good old Joe is the culprit behind all the missing stuff. These detectives don't waste a second. They slap handcuffs on Joe quicker than you can say guilty as charged. And just like that, the pawn shop transforms from a place of heated arguments to a full-blown crime scene. The shopkeeper, still in shock, watches as Joe gets escorted away by the police, handcuffs and all. The whole situation is so bonkers it can make anyone burst into laughter. It's like a comedy show with mix-ups, detectives with blurry faces, and a surprise twist. You'd be left thinking, did that seriously just happen? It's pure comedy gold, my friend. Comedy gold. A massive fraud. This one will truly astound you, so hold on to your chairs. The largest swindle to ever occur on the show, so far as people are aware, left everyone perplexed and alarmed. Basically, the boys said that someone from the shop had conned them. She pawned two of our laptops. 
can. She told us she was gonna give us the money and the laptop. To make a long story short, a woman pawned two of their laptops and then informed them that she knew someone who worked at the pawn shop and would give them the money and the laptops. You pawned something. Yes. She has the ticket. When did you pawn it? Today. Today. The males are left with nothing because she has their laptops, the money, and even the ticket to their belongings. You at the back door, so you'd end up with the laptops and the money? Yes. It astonished Ashley and Seth as much as it shocked Les. This girl told you one of my guys would meet you at the back door, so you'd end up with the laptop. Les or anybody else was unable to stop it now. Les then thought of a strategy, though. If you can find out which one of my employees, you give me the guy's name, I'll give you the computer. At that point, the youngster had a glimmer of optimism and left, believing that perhaps they could apprehend the employee. Well, let me tell you something. We've been scammed before, and I will not be scammed again. Less than requested that Ashley look up the buyer of each laptop they had that day on their background. Les realized something had clicked when she spent the entire day going through them and finding nothing. You're able to witness it. You'll get the money and the laptops. You go, hell yes, let's do it. Thus, these children were not the victims themselves. Instead, they had been attempting to con them all along. Well, here's the way it works. Nobody gets out of pawn without paying for it, and nothing goes out the back door. This time, they weren't duped either, although the kids did cause Ashley and the others a lot of worry during the day. The Bag Imagine this super funny video with a lady who's basically playing the I'm lost in a bag shop game at a crowded mall. So there's this awesome comedian pretending to be her, right? She strolls in like she just landed from Mars, completely clueless. Yeah, okay, I went to get my purse back to make my payment. Then, out of the blue, she locks eyes with a black bag, and boom, she's convinced it's her long-lost twin, with a mix of determination and total confusion. That's my purse right there. That one right there is black one. So I want to know why it's out there. She marches over to the lady in charge, ready to solve the mystery of the twin bags. It's like a comedy treasure hunt in a bag store, and you're in for a hilarious ride. Get ready to laugh your socks off. Here's the money. I want the purse. That bag was never in pawn. Now get this, the shopkeeper, a comedic genius with timing that's spot on, coolly spills the beans. She says, hey, this bag's not yours. But oh no, our lady on a mission won't back down. That's not your purse. How do you know it's not my purse? Because that purse has been out there. Let me see it. With this epic confidence, she declares, no way, this bag and I go way back. They're like childhood buddies. And here's the best part. You wanna buy it? I just wanna look at it and make sure it's not mine. She throws down the ultimate challenge. Bet you this bag, if it's not mine, I'll hand it over. But trust me, it's practically family. It's like a comedy duel in a bag shop, and you won't believe how hilarious it gets. Oh my god! Get your hands on me. Meet Cam, the scene stealer of the century. Picture this, chaos in the bag shop, and here comes Cam, our superhero security guard. He's like, hold my coffee and smoothly escorts the determined bag enthusiast off the counter. Have a nice day. Let's go. Oh, Walk yourself out, you, Walk you. Walk yes, you. But wait, she's clinging to her bag like it's a ticket to a comedy show. The laughs hit the roof as Cam keeps his poker face while chaos reigns. This video's a comedy roller coaster. And Cam, the unsung hero, it's a laugh-out-loud male adventure that you don't want to miss. Let's see what's with that pole, right? Go. Bitch! Go where you got to go. I'm going to kick your go. ass, you wait. Sign of free cash. I was trying to find out because your sign is saying that I can get 30 days. In the pawn shop sitcom, the worker dazzles the customer with the prospect of a 30-day cash fiesta. The seller, with a classic how can I help you line, unwittingly opens the door to financial freedom hilarity. It's a tale of interest-free loans, dollar storage fees, and a comedy of errors that promises 30 days of pawn shop shenanigans. But that's not what the Y'all saying it's saying it's misreading. It. No, it's you're misreading. Problem. The customer attempts a 30-day free cash caper, armed with a misinterpreted sign. The seller, caught in the crossfire, insists it's an interest-free loan bonanza, not a free cash party. Cue the comedic chaos as the customer points fingers, and the pawn shop sign becomes the unintentional star of a sitcom episode gone haywire. I need my cash. It says it right here. Free cash. The customer demands free cash like a rock star on tour. The seller, armed with the reality of interest-free loans, faces a barrage of demands. The customer, teetering on the edge of pawn pandemonium, enlists a surprise ally, a sassy woman who jumps in the scene like a comedy superhero. 
Cue the applause for this unexpected twist in the cash crusade. In the side-splitting aftermath, the pawn shop saga spills into the parking lot, where the customer and seller engage in a hilariously awkward brawl. Amidst a flurry of ass cracks and elbows, the spectacle unfolds, leaving the bystanders in stitches. The door slams and the customer vows a dramatic return with an unforgettable I'll be back exit line. Comedy gold in the pawn shop arena. I want to get my purse back to make my payment. She's telling me this is expired. That's my purse right there. That one right there is black one. The meticulous lady strides in armed with confidence and a fake receipt, proclaiming ownership of a purse. Little does she know that Ashley is the store's memory bank, fully aware of every item in its rightful place. The girl in her eagerness attempts to vault over the counter, unaware that Ashley, the guardian of scams, is on duty. My purse right there. How do you know that's your purse? Because I know my purse. Here's the money. I want the purse. That bag would never impose. If you are buying, I just want to look at it and make sure it's not mine. Undeterred by gravity and common sense, the girl persists in her charade. However, Ashley stands firm, recognizing the futility of the scam and the level of wrongness involved. It's like trying to sneak a peek at the answer key when the teacher is watching. Yeah, that's not happening. I'm not First of all, don't talk to me like I'm an idiot. You. Give me my purse or I'm going to come over that counter and get it myself. With a swift resolution to this failed escapade, the girl finds herself unceremoniously escorted out of the store. Lesson learned, Ashley's scam radar is always on and jumping over counters won't get you far in this pawn-filled drama. Alright, deal. I think I got a good deal and I know I'm going to be able to make some money on it. I can't believe you spent that much. Whatever, Ash. I am fuming. My brother just spent $800. Enter the family feud. Ashley drops the bomb on her brother Seth, calling him a hypocrite. But why? Well, he casually throws around $880 for a painting while Ashley, according to her, can't even snag a deal for 30 bucks. Sibling dynamics at their finest. But he'll yell at me over a $30 buy. Excuse me, Seth. What, Ash? Um, I was just out there watching you do a buy for $880. So instead of working and watching me. I was out there, mm -hmm. and you bought something for $880 when you gave me such crap about that $30 roulette table. Okay. I'm not buying plastic. I'm buying stuff that we can actually resell without a problem. You will never resell that. They will sit in the back and rot. Are you kidding? We'll put a friend in the store. We're going to make $1,000 plus really? on the deal. Really, Ash? You know I'm going to be okay. The plot thickens as Ashley confronts Seth about the apparent double standards. She probes into the intricacies of spending $880 questioning how bad it could be. Seth, in classic sibling fashion, argues that his purchases are all about resale value, a concept he conveniently forgets when it comes to Ashley's shopping habits. According to him, he's the revenue guru. You are just a hypocrite. She was just being ridiculous. I just wanted her to stop talking. Ash, what do you want from me? Apologize to me. Apologize? Apologize because you're such a hypocrite. You know what, Ash? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're a bitch. Fuck you, Seth. You're such an ass. I am not going to forget the situation anytime soon. Seth said her watch is back. Things heat up as Ashley demands an apology. Seth takes a nosedive into being the ultimate a-hole, apologizing for an $880 buy. <laughs> oh no. Instead, he hits her with a sorry not sorry for her supposed attitude, topping it off with a charming label. Well, let's just say that it rhymes with which. Sibling rivalry reaches a whole new level on this show. Two guys out here that are saying they were scammed out of their laptops and that whoever did it is working with one of our guys. You want to come on and talk to him? All right, thank you. Who is it? Les is hit with some unexpected news. A few guys claim that they've been pawned by a girl from the staff. Les, ever the detective, approaches the situation with a mix of suspicion and humor, wondering aloud if he's either unintentionally swindling customers or if bizarre customers have taken up a new form of thievery. Tell me. She pawned two of our laptops, and she told us she was going to bring them out to the back. Okay, wait, so you pawned something. Yes. She had to take it to When did you pawn it? Today. Today. Okay. She had to take it to her. And the money? Yes. 
These two kids come in and talk about have some girl pawn two laptops. The plot thickens as two disheveled DJs step into the scene, laptops held hostage. The atmosphere turns somber as the weight of the situation sinks in. It's a strange occurrence that has everyone wearing expressions of confusion and concern. Les, with his seasoned cool, casually queries about the laptop's ownership, revealing they're registered under the mysterious girl's name. Put the money three ways, and one of my employees was going to walk it out the back door. Either this is a new way for my employees to steal from me. To contact the owner because we want to. I am the owner. I'm just trying to switch the ticket so she can't have it. And it's in her name. The tension rises, but Les doesn't crack under pressure. Maturely handling the situation, he asserts that he needs the lowdown to work his magic and get those laptops back where they belong. It's a pawn shop mystery, and Les is the detective determined to unravel the peculiar case of laptops and loyalty. Josh walks into the pawn shop with his singlet looking like he wore it backwards. Now, there's a really timid looking young lady behind him who doesn't look happy at all. Well, that's none of Seth's business. All he's got to do is appraise the ring and get some money out of it. Clearly, the Thai guy doesn't get how the market works. I mean, we get that he's in desperate need of money, but the pawn shop's not going to give him a cent more than what his ring is worth. Oh, I'm Josh. Josh, nice to meet you. Yeah, I got two rings here I got from my neighbor. Uh, I bought from him. Okay. I'd like to get him checked out. Why do you need the money? I need to pay my court fees, I got a DUI, crashed my car, well, her car. I took her car with a couple friends. Things become awkward when Josh can't stop shutting his girlfriend up. Like, this dude is just a teen and he's got this kind of an attitude. What's going to become of him when he grows up to be a man? Perhaps he might then go physical with women. Honestly, this is ridiculous. Like, he's at fault for smashing the car, and yet he can't stop running his mouth. Tell me what it is. No, tell me what to do. Stop talking. Stand behind me. Whoa! What? What's, what's, what's the problem? To understand behind me. This overinflated ego giant sack of crap is gonna need some disciplining. He isn't even grown for Christ's sake. Like, where did he learn this nasty attitude from? Now, Seth isn't interested in the transaction anymore. He's already disgusted by this kid's attitude. Honestly, who wouldn't be? I gotta say, it's really satisfying to watch the guard drag him out of the store. You know, if he can't fix his attitude, he shouldn't expect anyone to tolerate him. The simple truth is that that girl has got to wake up, and this boy needs to grow up. Stop talking. Just Dude, stop talking. seriously, why are you Just such stop. an ass? No, you need to. No, I don't no. need to. You're so my store. This it is my, my property. Business. This it's is not my your property. property. Do She's I tell your, own your property person. what to do? You get shut out. the. Make me get out. Yeah, I will. Make me get out. Right now. Who the f are you? Who the f are you? Move on and realize that this guy's a complete tool. So trying to be a good boyfriend, right? We bet the staff at the pawn shop love their job, if for nothing else, at least for the drama that happens every day. Now, this is one funny scenario. A friend escorts her friend to the pawn shop only to realize that the laptop her friend wants to sell was stolen from her. Everyone is confused as the two friends who came together get into a fight. What the hell? You mean to tell me you don't stole my damn laptop and I don't need right. them damn hold kids for this damn hold laptop on this damn I think that these women were fighting. Now, these women are causing a scene, but they don't care at all. At least the fight's not against the staff of the pawn shop, so Les isn't bothered at all. Just when Les was about to hear the full gist, the friend who successfully got her laptop back came back for a rematch. Les is standing looking lost. Woo! 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 The funniest part of it is that the friend who threw things missed them all. She could steal her friend's laptop, but she can't even throw a can at a target? Now, on second thought, this lady's audacity is pretty insane. Did she think that her friend wouldn't notice that it's her laptop or her friend would just stand there and watch her sell it? Kids! I think that these women were fighting over a laptop. You know what? We ain't even friends no motherfucking mo. F you! Don't come to my house! At least they weren't yelling at us. Little bony ass! The man walks in with a unique Native American artifact and Seth loves it. Things go south when the seller uses Ashley's joke on her. Now Ashley doesn't like it and Seth isn't helping matters either. The problem is that Ashley is too emotional to be a businesswoman sometimes. So the pawn shop loses an artifact because of an innocent joke that was even apologized for. 
and to think that Ashley started it makes it even more ridiculous. How you doing? How you doing? Got a few Native American artifacts here for you. Uh, this is a tomahawk right here. This is the war club. Resembles it, doesn't it? It's closer to you. <laughs> it is, right? It's the same color hair. 90 bucks? No, actually, I'm not interested. He was rude, Seth. He was just joking. He was not joking. My sister takes things way too personally. He was rude. The people in line have not complained, but someone who just walked in a few seconds ago and never even stood in the line has got a lot to complain about. Hey, I'd like to follow my TV. I'm really sorry, but I can't help you at this window, sir. This is the jewelry loan line. You gotta go to the equipment line. Thanks. Ma'am, I don't have the time to wait in that line. That line is way too long. I realize that. I'm really sorry. This is the jewelry yeah. line. No, no, this is bull. You see that big old line? How about you go wait in that line? Seriously? Yes. That is a long line. For a second, we thought that Ashley would go over to Seth's side and help the customer. So the customer can't talk properly. He's not entitled to any form of hospitality. I will take your TV gladly. I'm going to give it to Byron, okay? You're never going to walk in here. Oh, no, I'm not putting up with me. this. No, no. There is a line, but you're what? not going to come in here. Oh, it's it's demanding here, here. Money. Oh, yeah, okay. Seth's new system is causing problems. But I gave him control while I recovered. I have to give him some slack. Most times when customers try to sell their items, they believe they can sell them for the price that they bought them for. Well, things don't work that way, Skippy. The pawn shop's got to make its own profit from each item. After all, this isn't exactly a charity drive. Throwing a tantrum's not going to make Seth buy it for a hundred bucks either. I'm trying to see how much I can get for this. I'm trying to get like, I'm trying to get at least a hundred for it. A hundred dollars? Yeah. I won't even be able to sell it for near that. Twenty dollars. The hell you mean? I'm more or less healthy than anything. Man, I'm going to need more than $20 for this, man. All right, where's your manager? Uh, I'm the manager. Oh, you are the manager. I'm the manager. You're the manager? I'm the well, manager. Give me more than $20 for this. Shit. I've been waiting for an hour. Les comes in to find out the cause of the commotion and gets roasted by the customer. Les goes insane with the money and the customer hits him. Don't know. Huh? And what the f you going to do, old man? Who the f you calling him? Really, mother? I got this. I what? got it. You want to give me more than twenty dollars? Get out! Time to go. You. I got a guy out there screaming and yelling at me because well, of that something, something that new? you did. Your system does not work, Seth. I've been watching this go down all day. Ashley and Seth are definitely not ready to be in charge yet, and at this rate. They may never be ready. Why do these guys think they're entitled to money from the pawn shop? Like, there's no law that forces the pawn shop to buy an item from them. I'm just looking for a couple dollars, you know what I'm saying? To be honest, I don't think we're going to take them, brother. You say what? We're not interested. Because right, right you know here. it's outdated. You got pops standing behind me. What's up with that? Nothing. You're just causing a scene, so. Y'all about to rush me or something? I'm I mean, you too close you. anyway, homie. Huh? You too close. You steady getting close. How about that? Come on now, this is a really outdated television. Does she think that this is a historical artifact or something? Like the audacity to even bring it along to the pawn shop is crazy. Hey, yo, man, it's carrying my shit out then. Y'all wanted to do like that. Y'all surrounding me around this mother. I mean, what's up with that? Don't be ever throwing the at me. You understand right, that? Trying, you understand trying, that, trying that trying man? Trying you understand that, that, dog? American jury. Where the is the law on it? Don't try to stare me down either. Because y'all got to close. This mother thought he was a badass. As you can see, I'm a badass. How are you? I'm doing OK. What can I help you with? Either trying to get a loan on it, or you guys can buy it. Mm -hmm. Trying to sell it for maybe like 150 50 bucks. Why is it $50? The certificate and everything is in there. And the bag costs actually way more than that. Well, if you can know? tell, it's actually stained. Okay. All through here. I'm trying to sell it for 150 or get a loan. $75 instead of the 50 Yeah, I wasn't interested in more than 50 If you know purses, then you know the As our unsuspecting customer strolls into the kitchen at Chaos, little does she know what's cooking today. Ashley, patiently bracing herself for another round of absurdity, politely inquires about what the customer is looking to offload. The girl, blissfully unaware of the purse's actual value, confidently suggests a price that's almost a steal. It costs way more than Okay, but I'm not going to pay you for the amount that you think it's worth because it 
stain. This is not one of the newer ones. This is not this season. I know about purses. It was porn. It was stained. It's not even the last season's bag. Thing is old. But you still willing to buy for fifty dollars though? So if it wasn't worth. And now the plot thickens. The lady asserts that if Ashley truly understood purses, she'd gladly accept the offered amount. However, Ashley, standing firm in her claim that the purse is torn and not worth more than fifty bucks, creates a hilarious clash of valuation difference. We even say fifty dollars. So they didn't say it wasn't worth. Can I talk to somebody else? I'm gonna talk to your pepperoni looking at. Can I get some? My pepperoni looking at. Pepperoni ass? I don't even know what that means. She take a look at her own. Can I get somebody else to talk to? It don't even matter. I don't have to talk to you. And I don't have to talk to you either, so why don't you go home? Can I talk store? to somebody nope. else? Why do I have to talk to you? Because you disrespectful. I'm, the I'm disrespectful and you call me a pepperoni ass? Ugly ass bitch. F you. And it's time to cue the drama. Ashley throws out the bold figure of 50 bucks, and it hits the customer like a curveball she wasn't ready for. Feeling the heat, our lady teeters on the edge of diplomacy and blurts out the unforgettable line. She labels Ashley a pepperoni ass and decides that she'd rather chat with anyone but her. Talk about spicing up negotiations. Three males walked into a pawn shop. One of the suspects stood at the door as a lookout while the other two suspects walked directly over to the display cases. So, like, these three guys roll into the pawn shop, just casually strolling in. The other two guys, they head straight to the fancy display cases. It's all got suspicious vibes. And then, bam! One of them whips out a sledgehammer and starts smashing the glass. Things are starting to get pretty wild. At some point, a customer from the place is seen leaving calmly while the lookout tells her to hurry up. The suspects appear to be wearing heavy-duty gloves in order... At one moment, a person from the shop strolls out all calm, and someone's keeping an eye on her, urging her to speed up. The people thought to be involved seem to have on these tough gloves, maybe so they don't get any cuts. Not to get cut while removing the glass from the cases. Both suspects placed the jewelry and many other valuables in the bags. So when they took off the glass from the cases, both of them put the jewelry and lots of other valuable stuff into bags. After that, they hightailed it out of the store in a black mercury marquee. Case at? Where the case at? Where was it at? The guy storms into the pawn shop all worked up and starts shouting about a missing case. He's demanding to know where it is and he appears to be accusing the staff of removing. The feeling of stress in the air is increasing and it's obvious that something is wrong. He's accusing us of taking games out of his unit look at the ticket it never said with game the atmosphere gets even more intense as the guy accuses the pawn shop of messing with his games unless the cool guy at the pawn shop stands his ground the customers getting more agitated making accusations and even talking about blowing up the place which is just adding to the chaos after all the stress i have the last thing i need is a customer causing a scene. Despite the escalating situation, Les stays calm. He tries to talk sense into the upset customer, especially with a big event coming up the next day. I know how to mother walk. Talking I ain't illiterate because I part of the week you know, and y'all more in my middle and put them games in there. And you wasn't even standing there when I posited it. So I need to blow this place up. It's time to go, sir. You ain't gonna get my window. I'm not let go, let go. Can I get my weed? Don't get it for you, don't worry. You're making a threat like that? The situation becomes alarming when the upset customer makes a threat to blow up the place. Less rightfully concerned about the safety of everybody, asks the guy to leave. Security becomes a priority, and the customer's demand for his belongings takes a backseat to the potential danger that he's creating. That's a challenging moment for Les, who's just trying to manage the chaos caused by an irate customer. So this customer walks into the shop with this antique necklace, claiming it's been passed down through generations. Can you help me, sir? I'm trying to get a nice deal on my antique necklace. It's been passed down from generation to generation. My grandfather gave it to me, okay? Plus, isn't exactly doing cartwheels because this necklace isn't blinged out with diamonds or gold, just some crystals. But the customer's on a mission for a sweet deal, even if it's not a precious metal masterpiece. My grandfather gave it to him. But Les, being more into precious metals than history, isn't interested. So, how much can I get? Well, you can't get anything. It's not diamonds, it's not gold, it's just crystals.
Now hold up, Les spots the customer's rings and gets that twinkle in his eye. But the customer is all like, I want a deal on the necklace, dude. Les though is playing hardball, saying they only dance with precious metals. No crystals invited to this ball. Customer's rings catch Les's eye. I'll take your rings. The rings ain't for sale today. How much would you pawn this for? I won't take that in pawn because we only take precious metal. Now cue the shouting match. Back and forth negotiations, but it's like a standoff and no deal is going down. Now, take it. Well, I think you need to work something out with me, man. What are you standing here for, man? He's like, Tell me, brother. Is antique, man. Nope. The customer tries negotiating with Les, but no deal is struck. The security, though, offers a deal of their own. Customers are not thrilled, yelling about deals and fairness. It's a bit of a scene, you know? But here's the twist. Les finally gives in and says, all right, give me those rings. Customer storms out, still yelling a bit. Oh man, antique shop life. Am I right? I'm antique, bro. I don't want to talk. Me and you. No deal. Deal. No deal. How much you gonna give me for? I'm gonna talk about it on the way out the door. Hey, hold on, man. Oh, hold on, hold on, bro, man. Hold on. I can leave on my own. Hey, what's up? Bro. Big fella. Have a nice day. Gave me something. Give me the ring. I'll take the ring in pawn. Don't worry about it. Michael expressed interest in buying it for their collection. After negotiation, they settle on a price of $3,500, considering it's for charity. Seth shares his personal connection to wrestling matches with his father, adding sentimental value to the purchase. We we'll have okay. that kind of money. All right. You. All of y'all. Bitch. If you want some help, talk to us like a human being. Aloha. There. The woman gets angrier and calls Ashley names. Ashley stays calm but tells her to talk respectfully. The woman leaves angrily and this situation doesn't get resolved. On picking up very expensive pieces, grabs Les's attention. Hey, hey, sir, don't touch it. Sir, if there's anything you want to see, we'll be more than happy to show you, sir. Well, what do you know? Expensive pieces tend to be fragile. How am I going to see if it's going to work? I told The customer starts touching expensive items, catching Les's attention. Les politely asks them not to touch anything, offering assistance in viewing items instead. They sure, that's why I asked you. Look that's when you're back there and he's over. Oh, I'll come out right out there. You think I give it? The customer insists on touching, arguing it's necessary to check functionality. Les tries to explain store policy, but the customer gets upset. Out of my store. Oh, don't time don't to touch it. Don't it's time to go. You're lucky you got some. The customer's frustration grows, prompting Les to ask them to leave for disrupting the store. Les firmly directs the customer to leave, highlighting their luck in having assistance. Jersey just moved into the town and is on an errand from his wife. Uh, my oh. wife and I, we just bought a house and she sent me here. She said, see what you can pick up. Let's find some. I'll bet you can make it. A middle-aged man from New Jersey recently moved into town is running an errand from his wife to find furniture for their new house. He spots a couch in the store and expresses interest in making a deal. After looking at a cheap couch, the customer notices that the couch is dirty. You gonna clean all that up before I buy it? That's why it's so inexpensive. I gotta tell you, man, that's nasty. Our used furniture sometimes has things on While checking the couch, the customer notices its dirty condition and questions if it'll be cleaned before purchased. The store attendant explains that the low price reflects its use status, which includes some dirtiness typical of secondhand items. Seven, seven, really? Seven. Well, I only got 200 bucks. After sitting down to give the couch a try, the customer begins being disrespectful to Les. And let me try this. Look, my shoes are cleaner than this couch. Then don't buy it. Make me a deal. I got cash in my pocket, man. Wow. The man doesn't like how the couch looks and tries to pay less for it with the money that he has. He starts being rude, saying bad things about how dirty the couch is and insulting the store. I bet you you're the mother that's been sitting on here farting. This was actually my couch. We had a reupholster and I gave it to Ashley. When the comment reaches Ashley, Les's daughter, Les has enough of this customer. Is that your daughter? That's my daughter. She must be nasty too. The customer's derogatory comments extend to Ashley, Les's daughter, who works at the store. Les, the owner, has had enough and confronts the disrespectful customer, defending his daughter and the store's reputation. How are we doing in the deep? Oh, Les decides to end the interaction, urging the customer to leave the store. The customer, unwilling to change his behavior, decides to go elsewhere, ending the encounter on a sour note. Excuse me. Hi. Hi, I have a question for you. Yeah. Okay, I went to 
get my purse back to make my payment. She's telling me this is expired. That's my purse right there. That one right there is black one. So I want to know why it's out there. A girl approaches Ashley in the pawn shop with a question about her purse. She claims that her purse, which she points to, was wrongfully labeled as expired and she demands to know why it's out for sale. My purse right there. How do you know that's your purse? Because I know my purse. Here's the money. I want the purse. Yeah, if you don't give me the purse, I'm going to climb over the counter and get it myself. Just give me my purse. The girl argues that the purse refers to her and displays money, as evidently Les decides to eject her from the shop, ending the encounter. Have you guys seen the 32 Roadster? I haven't seen this, son. Someone probably stole it. It was parked in the warehouse. How could someone steal it? A high-tech thief could get into this warehouse easy. Rick becomes anxious when he learns that Corey took the expensive 32 Roadster to the gym fearing potential damage to the valuable merchandise. Have you guys seen the 32 Roadster? I haven't seen it, son. Someone probably stole it. It was parked in the warehouse. How could someone steal it? A high-tech thief can get into this warehouse easy. All you have to do is cut a hole in the roof and lift it out with a helicopter. Pick the lock. And the conversation shifts to the possibility of the Roadster being stolen with various theories proposed, including high-tech theft methods like using helicopters or hacking into security systems. Roadster around? I'm not driving it around. I just took it to the gym. That's driving it around. The thing is in perfect condition. What if you wreck it? What if you ding it? What if you scratch I'm it? I'm not an idiot. I'm your partner. Rick says he didn't drive the Roadster just for fun. He says he only took it to the gym. He defends himself from being called careless. He reminds everybody that he's a partner in the business. I can't believe my dad's giving me a hard time about this. I mean, what's the point of owning a pawn shop? Tensions raise between Rick and his father as they argue over the handling of the Roadster. Rick feels frustrated by his father's skepticism and restrictions, questioning the purpose of owning a pawn shop if he can't enjoy its items. Later found out that the car was not nearly worth $68,000. His expert had failed to notice that the car was a hot rod. Later, Rick learns that the Roadster is worth a lot more than he realized, valued at nearly $68,000 due to its hot rod modification. So what can I help you with today? Got uh, this ring right here. See how much it might be worth. Okay. I also wanted to know how much it goes. A customer brings in a ring for an appraisal and to inquire about pawning it for cash. He seeks to understand its value and potential loan amount. What are you talking about? You said you were coming in to get a receiver. Why'd you take my ring? Well, I wanted to see how much it was worth. Well, why'd you take my ring? Yesterday you said you needed bike parts and didn't have the damn money, and all of a sudden you got my damn ring. The problem started when Les checked the ring to see how much it's worth. The cashier, however, Ashley stands firm, recognizing the futility of the scam and the level of wrongness involved. It's like trying to sneak a peek at the answer key when the teacher is watching. Yeah, that's not happening. I'm not With a swift resolution to this failed escapade, the girl finds herself unceremoniously escorted out of the store. Lesson learned, Ashley's scam radar is always on and jumping over counters won't get you far in this pawn-filled drama. Deal. I think I got a good deal, and I know I'm gonna be able to make some money on it. I can't believe you spent that much. Whatever, Ash. I am fuming. My brother just spent eight hundred dollars. Enter the family feud. Ashley drops the bomb on her brother Seth, calling him a hypocrite. But why? Well, he casually throws around $880 for a painting while Ashley, according to her, can't even snag a deal for 30 bucks. Sibling dynamics at their finest. But he'll yell at me over a $30 buy. Excuse me, Seth. What, Ash? Um, I was just out there watching you do a buy for $880. So I started working and watching me. I was out there, mm -hmm. and you bought something for eight hundred eighty dollars. When you gave me such crap about that thirty dollar roulette table, okay. I'm not buying plastic. I'm buying something we can actually resell without a problem. We'll never resell that. They will sit in the back and rot. Are you kidding? We'll put a sign on the store. We're going to make a thousand dollars plus really? on the deal. Really, Ash? You know I'm going to be upset. The plot thickens as Ashley confronts Seth about the apparent double standards. She probes into the intricacies of spending eight hundred and eighty dollars 
questioning how bad it could be. Seth, in classic sibling fashion, argues that his purchases are all about resale value, a concept he conveniently forgets when it comes to Ashley's shopping habits. According to him, he's the revenue guru. You are just a hypocrite. She was just being ridiculous. I just wanted her to stop talking. Ash, what do you want from me? Apologize to me. Apologize? Apologize because you're such a hypocrite. You know what, Ash? I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're a bitch. Fuck you, Seth. You're such an ass. I am not going to forget the situation anytime soon. Seth better watch his back. Things heat up as Ashley demands an apology. Seth takes a nosedive into being the ultimate a-hole, apologizing for an $880 buy. <laughs> oh no. Instead, he hits her with a sorry not sorry for her supposed attitude, topping it off with a charming label. Well, let's just say that it rhymes with which. Sibling rivalry reaches a whole new level on this show. There's two guys out here that are saying they were scammed out of their laptops and that whoever did it is working with one of our guys. You want to come out and talk to him? All right. Thank you. Who is it? Les is hit with some unexpected news. A few guys claim that they've been pawned by a girl from the staff. Les, ever the detective, approaches the situation with a mix of suspicion and humor, wondering aloud if he's either unintentionally swindling customers or if bizarre customers have taken up a new form of thievery. Tell me. She pawned two of our laptops, and she told us she was going to bring them out to the back. Okay, wait, you pawned something? Yes. She had to take it to her. When did you pawn it? Today. Today. Okay. She had to take it to her. And the money? Yes. These two kids come in and talk about have some girl pawned two laptops. The plot thickens as two disheveled DJs step into the scene, laptops held hostage. The atmosphere turns somber as the weight of the situation sinks in. It's a strange occurrence that has everyone wearing expressions of confusion and concern. Les, with his seasoned cool, casually queries about the laptop's ownership, revealing they're registered under the mysterious girl's name. Put the money three ways, and one of my employees was going to walk it out the back door. Either this is a new way for my employees to steal from me. To contact the owner because we want to. I am the owner. I'm just trying to switch the ticket so she can't have me. And it's in her name. I can't do it. The tension rises, but Les doesn't crack under pressure. Maturely handling the situation, he asserts that he needs the lowdown to work his magic and get those laptops back where they belong. It's a pawn shop mystery, and Les is the detective determined to unravel the peculiar case of laptops and loyalty. Because your sign is saying that I can get 30 days of free cash. If you're a new customer with us, first 30 days, you can get interest-free loan. You only pay a dollar per store. But it's saying if I brought a friend with me, then I can get 30 days of free cash. It's for an interest-free loan. Okay, so there came a woman at the counter. Let's see what she's going to come up with. Is she asking for free money? I think she might possibly be mad, though it is kind of funny that she's got enough courage to come up and ask for money without investing anything. Now, the lady at the counter frowned and asked her if she paid or not. Intriguingly, she hasn't paid anything, but she's still asking for money. Uh, holy shit, what's wrong with some people? You're just misreading it. No, it's you're your misreading problem. the f That's not what the f y'all saying to say, bitch. It says I get free cash. For 30 days in this motherfucker. Where does it say that? Where does it say that? Who told you we're getting it? You didn't. I'm not talking to you. I need my cash. I need my cash. It says it right here. Free cash. Oh, and to make matters worse, she started shouting at her. Everyone around started looking at her, wondering what the hell was going on. Seth and Les get a little furious as everybody's just standing around trying to figure out what's going on. She started bullying her, but the lady tried to explain to her again that she misunderstood the agreement and they're not just going to give her free cash. But this lady's just not listening to anybody. Well, Seth then enters, so who knows what's going to happen now. I brought my friend with me. If you get a loan and you refer a friend, you can get 30 days interest free. It doesn't mean we're just going to hand you cash. Who do you have to pawn? Come on now. You got to have I'm no screaming, can you read? Read what no, it says. I can read. I can read. 
Les entered and asked her whether she read the whole document or not, and she was not listening and constantly arguing and pointing to them as if they had done something wrong. Meanwhile, other women decided to intrude, and oh my god, it's gonna be funny. Looks like they've all decided to have a fight in the pawn shop. Wonder how that's all gonna end. And it looks like Les is gonna join in too. The other woman that just jumps in the middle. All you need to do is read. Uh, now see the other women get in and start shouting at her as everybody behind her was waiting for her to get out of the queue. So they started fighting and now they're all having an immense fight. Everybody around is watching and laughing at them. Well, the guard had to go and break everything up. Well, at least they're all gonna get treated the same way, especially the one who created the mess. Pretty sure they're gonna hold them up and throw them out. And there they go, they're still shouting and fighting with each other as well. They really wanted to go at it, so we let them go at it in the parking lot for a little minute. All I saw was ass cracks and elbows. They were sent outside and they started beating on each other, holding each other by their hand. They beat the crap out of each other and people around them were just watching and waiting and having a curious but funny conversation about their nonsense. Let's talk about a hella cringe episode. All right, this is Robert. Robert, Dennis. Okay, so there's a guy coming into the pawn shop with something in his hand, maybe a poster. But what's it for? He came to Seth and the other man and showed them this poster. Now it feels like they're interested in it, and there might be a handsome deal between them. Detroit Lions players had signed. Did you drag it in? Uh -huh. So during the flood, I seen it down there, and that's when I pulled it out. She went down there, and she supported these people, and while she was walking the picket line, she would have gathered signature. You got Williams over here. That's what Steve Farkas. This is the first time a guy actually brought in and I just got on the picket line because I'm on strike right now myself. We've been on strike for almost three months now. Thousand dollars. He started describing the poster that's mainly about the protest of people in history and it's got lots of signs of well-known people and has got a lot of worth. He explained everything in one go and demanded a heavy amount for it as it was really valuable to him. Seth told him that it's got some stains on it and it's no doubt the same poster of historical strike which made it worthy but for him it might make a lot of difference. I hate the condition of it. I understand and I gotta understand when it comes down to collectors, everything is about condition. Absolutely. And I'm sure if your your dad saw this, jump on the heartbeat. Seth and the man explained that it's not about the worth that he's asking for in terms of thousands of dollars, but it's also about the condition of the poster, and it's not in a very good one. The man is continuously arguing that it's got signs all over it. Les has seen it that he'll definitely be surprised and definitely pay more than a thousand bucks. Well, as for Les, he just came in. Sharper. They need to make an effort to close these deals quickly. Through my research in that, I seen personally that one just like this, Mento, and he got nine hundred fifty dollars for it. Right. Make so it if that was me. Why would you want a thousand for this? He only had one signature. I have at least a dozen. But with this tear up here? Yeah, and the condition it's in, the, the, the water stain on the bottom, it's just a hard thing to sell. Yeah, but even though it's in this condition, how many of you exist? Very rare. Yeah. And it's uncertified. Right. You know. I'll sell for five. Lust judged the entire piece and told him that he's asking for too much. And later on, they further described that it's torn from the top and the bottom. And it's also got damage and they can't pay more for it. But he still won't agree to pay for it. But he did say that he'd charge five hundred dollars off of the amount but they couldn't reduce it any further value let's make a deal 75 bucks no no way who's gonna buy it from you i'll just put it back in my basement let it collect dust offering you just a hundred dollars cash money right now wouldn't make a difference the same 200 if nobody in life is ever gonna offer you more than us According to Seth, it's a historical and cool piece and might be a profitable deal for them. So he asked the man if they'll pay 750 bucks for it. But the man was stunned and said that they're paying too little. He said that you should pay more, but Les is arguing that no one can pay you more than this. You change your mind, we'll on to the hundred. Which would you prefer? 520s or a $100 bill? 520 seems like more, wouldn't it? 520. to me. 520s right now. $100. Take it or leave it. 520s. Bye, guys. Deal. 100 bucks. Thank you. All right, Thank you. 
There is no question, it's a one of a kind piece yet. It's a little bit of damage on it, but it's got a lot of autographs. I know we're gonna make a profit. He asked for $200, but no, it's not gonna be a good deal, and they told him to leave. The man in need got a severe shock and held up the poster thinking. Les again said that they can't pay more than 100 bucks, and after some time of quietness, they agreed to the deal. Finally, the happy deal was made. Right there. Here they come again. Les? Hi, how are you? I'm attorney Kyle Dequeep. So there's a man, probably an attorney with two ladies along, coming inside towards Les at a pawn shop. Now, Les knew about it before. He asked for Les, and fortunately, he was at the counter. He asked why they had arrived at the store. He's retained me to represent her in regard to a ring. Okay. My client brought in a $10,000 ring here, and she wants to either collect the remaining money owed to her on the ring or get the ring back. She's got a receipt. Let me explain to you. This is a counterfeit ticket. He said that he came here for the ring which they bought from these ladies for $10,000, but they didn't pay and gave them the receipt. Now, he put up the receipt and showed it to Les and accused them of cheating and stealing from the women and taking their expensive ring. But Les was cool and controlled his anger. The scene, yeah. the scene. Whoever produced this ticket didn't understand this is the amount of numbers that are here. Okay. Number two is state law mandates that we print the law in a 12-point font. Okay. This is much smaller. That is some bull****. It may be bull****. But that's the truth. I don't know how I got mixed up. But There's the game changing point. Les, after listening to him, explained that he will reveal the truth now by showing the real receipt that they had. He went and came back with real receipts that they've been giving to the customers. There, he spotted major differences. He notified him of the major changes in the receipt that he brought. The man looked rather weak and stunned in response. Printing wrong or whatever, but this is the ticket he got from here. He didn't get it from here. He didn't yeah. get it from here. So now we just like. Just I'm not here. saying that you are. Oh, so you trying to say my son a lot. I wish I had better news for you, but is. that's bull. That's bull. The numbers don't match up. The paper stack doesn't match up. This is a fake. Now you sad with you're them. You're not representing us. You're not representing if I don't you, get my yeah. ring or my money for them, how you gonna get paid? The attorney turned to the women, but oh my God, they're still accusing Les of having given them the wrong receipt and asking the attorney to take the money from Les. The man, being down on himself, as you can see, argued with. Him. The man showed the evidence to the ladies and told them that they were having the wrong receipt, but they continued to argue. The ticket, how about that? Nah, I I don't believe that the store gave you this ticket. Nah, well, I don't yeah. believe you a real attorney. Right. Right. This this the you ain't got better you give me people, my money. You with these money. Yeah. He's my attorney. You, him, security. The ladies started harassing both of them and started using personal attacks. They were all arguing amongst themselves. <laughs> Pretty crazy. The attorney went back as he can't do anything for the ladies. How are you? I'm doing okay. What well, can I help you with? Either trying to get a loan on it or you guys can buy it. Mm -hmm. Trying to sell it for maybe like 150 50 bucks. Why is it $50? The certificate and everything is in there. And the bag costs actually way more than that. Well, if you can tell, it's actually stained. Okay. All through here. I'm trying to sell it for $150 or get a loan for $75 instead of the 50 Yeah, I wasn't interested in more than 50 If you know purses, then you know the As our unsuspecting customer strolls into the kitchen at Chaos, little does she know what's cooking today. Ashley, patiently bracing herself for another round of absurdity, politely inquires about what the customer is looking to offload. The girl, blissfully unaware of the purse's actual value, confidently suggests a price that's almost a steal. It costs way more than it. Okay, but I'm not going to pay you for the amount that you think it's worth because it's Stain. This is not one of the newer ones. This is not this season. I know about purses. It was porn. It was stained. It's not even the last season's bag. Thing is old. But you still willing to buy for fifty dollars though? So if it wasn't worth. And now the plot thickens. The lady asserts that if Ashley truly understood purses, she'd gladly accept the offered amount. However, Ashley, standing firm in her claim that the purse is torn and not worth more than fifty bucks, creates a hilarious clash of valuation difference. We even say fifty dollars. So they didn't say it wasn't worth. Can I talk? To somebody else, I don't want to talk to your pepperoni looking ass. Can I get some? My pepperoni else? looking ass. Pepperoni ass? I don't even know what that means. She take a look at her own ass. Can I get somebody else to talk to? It don't even matter. I don't have to talk to you. And I don't talk to you either. So why don't you go home? Leave Can her I store. talk to somebody nope. else? Why do I have to talk to you? Because you disrespectful. I'm, I'm disrespectful, and you call me a pepperoni ass? Ugly ass bitch. F you. And it's time to cue the drama. 
Ashley throws out the bold figure of 50 bucks, and it hits the customer like a curveball she wasn't ready for. Feeling the heat, our lady teeters on the edge of diplomacy and blurts out the unforgettable line. She labels Ashley a pepperoni ass and decides that she'd rather chat with anyone but her. Talk about spicing up negotiations. Three males walked into a pawn shop. One of the suspects stood at the door as a lookout while the other two suspects walked directly over to the display cases. So, like, these three guys roll into the pawn shop, just casually strolling in. The other two guys, they head straight to the fancy display cases. It's all got suspicious vibes. And then, bam! One of them whips out a sledgehammer and starts smashing the glass. Things are starting to get pretty wild. At some point, a customer from the place is seen leaving calmly while the lookout tells her to hurry up. The suspects appeared to be wearing heavy-duty gloves in order... At one moment, a person from the shop strolls out all calm, and someone's keeping an eye on her, urging her to speed up. The people thought to be involved seem to have on these tough gloves, maybe so they don't get any cuts. Not to get cut while removing the glass from the cases. Both suspects placed the jewelry and many other valuables in the bags. So when they took off the glass from the cases, both of them put the jewelry and lots of other valuable stuff into bags. After that, they hightailed it out of the store in a black Mercury marquee. Where the case at? Where the case at? Where is it at? The guy storms into the pawn shop, all worked up, and starts shouting about a missing case. He's demanding to know where it is, and he appears to be accusing the staff of removing. The feeling of stress in the air is increasing, and it's obvious that something is wrong. He's accusing us of taking games out of his unit look at the ticket it never said with game the atmosphere gets even more intense as the guy accuses the pawn shop of messing with his games unless the cool guy at the pawn shop stands his ground the customer is getting more agitated making accusations and even talking about blowing up the place which is just adding to the chaos after all the stress i have the last thing i need is a customer causing a scene. Despite the escalating situation, Les stays calm. He tries to talk sense into the upset customer, especially with a big event coming up the next day. I know how to mother walk. I ain't illiterate because I parted a week and y'all more in my middle and put them motherfuckers games in there. And you weren't even standing there when I posited. Somebody need to blow this place up. Let's get this thing popping. Let's get this thing popping. It's time to go, sir. You ain't gonna get my weed off. The situation becomes alarming when the upset customer makes a threat to blow up the place. Less rightfully concerned about the safety of everybody, asks the guy to leave. Security becomes a priority, and the customer's demand for his belongings takes a backseat to the potential danger that he's creating. That's a challenging moment for Les, who's just trying to manage the chaos caused by an irate customer. How's it going, man? What's going on, man? Everything good. How about you? Doing good. Good. What can I do for you? Let me get this like 400 for this watch right here. What can I do for you today? Can I get like 400 for this watch right here? It's worth a 20. Les, chilling at the pawn shop, notices a guy walking in, watch in hand. Les, being friendly, asks how things are going. The guy hopeful wants 400 bucks for his watch. Les, the cool pawn detective, calmly discusses the watch's worth, revealing it's valued at about 82 bucks. Yo, man, tell me the truth. What'd you really pay? Tell you the truth, man. Yeah, Come on, give me, four, give me four for this watch, oh, man. Come on, man. We deal in high-end watches. This was worthless. Nothing for us to deal with. Come on, give me like 450 for this watch, man, yo. Man. I got a baby on the way, dog. Congratulations. I'm sick of living, I'm sick of living at the f***ing crib, man. My girl on my the negotiation heat rises as the guy insists on 400, but Les suggests seven. The guy pleading and sharing his life story about a baby on the way asks for 400 again. Les stands firm, offering him the same price, which leads to a bit of yelling. The guy, feeling frustrated, calls the place bull ass and expresses his discontent. You want ten dollars? Oh no! I do with ten dollars. I have no idea. Go to Coney Island. Give me ten dollars. Go to Coney Island. No fucking ten dollars. The tension escalates, and the guy feels disrespected, using strong words and even threatening less. Less staying cool, so just maybe he should have been given 400 bucks, hinting at a broken lamp that needs payment. The situation gets intense, with the guy considering if he should have taken the deal. Some cash for this watch, man. 400? 
I'm sorry. There's a bullshit ass punch, man. This whole ass punch, boss. Uh, excuse me. You call it what? You call him a bitch? You. I'll knock you the out. You know who you're talking to? Tell me. You know, don't touch me, homie, dog. Touch me, dude. Then maybe he would have been able to pay me for the lamp that he broke. Yo, I'm off with you, dog. The guy, still upset, leaves the shop, but not without some fiery words. Les reflects on the encounter, realizing maybe he should have given 400 bucks to avoid the chaos. The drama ends, leaving behind a mix of emotions and a used watch. Life at the pawn shop remains unpredictable and full of surprises. How are you doing today? Hey, pretty good. How are you? Doing good, thanks. I'm Les. Les, I'm Randall. How are you? Randall. Oh, you got a hell of a grip. Wow. What the hell is it? Call it a ring. Okay. I didn't think it was a bus. Um, how'd you get it? I just got it. This guy smelled like a brewery. Okay. How much did you want? I'd like 500 for it. Why? Why? Because I need it. Yeah, I, I, I get got you. two DUIs. A person walks into the pawn shop, catching Les's attention. Things start getting interesting right away. The person wants $500 for a ring and shows it to Les. Les, being curious, asks where the ring came from and why they want to sell it. The person gets really mad when Les asks questions. The intensity in the air rises as the person angrily explains why they're selling the ring. Les stays calm, making it a surprising and dramatic moment in the pawn shop. Well, if it was gold, I'd give you more than 500, but it's not real. Not I know it's worth $500 and you're gonna give me 500. Well, actually, if this was gold, but it was brass. It had no value. I understand you have court issues. The problem is I need $500 for I'm it. I'm sure please. you do. Man, I, I don't know why you need as the conversation continues, Les drops a bombshell. He tells the person that if the ring were real gold, he'd offer a whopping $2,500. Feeling a glimmer of hope, the customer suggests, just give me the $2,500 then. Expectantly awaiting a positive response, Les, with a touch of humor, reveals the harsh reality. He explains that the ring is fake, not even worth $500, and he won't pay that much for a counterfeit ring. You gotta give me something for it. I can't give it to you. I'm sorry. Give it to me anyway. Man, you can give me something for it. No, 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 you can give me something for it. Just the glass. This guy was drunk. You give me that ring back. It's give me the, that. It's the. It's the. Oh, I ain't going nowhere. Man, get away from me. Get out of here! I go, man. You man. In the midst of the ring discussion, a security guard quietly enters, taking a position behind the customer. The customer, desperate, pleads with Les to give him something for the ring. But Les, staying true to his detective skills, rejects the plea, emphasizing the ring's fake nature. Les, sensing trouble, comments that the customer seems drunk, adding another unexpected twist to the escalating situation. As the rejection sinks in, the customer, unable to contain his frustration, sits on the floor declaring that he won't leave. The tension peaks as he becomes increasingly aggressive. The guard steps into action, forcefully dragging the defiant customer out of the store. But despite being escorted out, the customer continues to yell and make a scene. Oh boy. I see you sweating. Yeah. It must be hot outside. No, I was doing karate outside. You're doing karate? I do though. I'm Bruce Lee's sister. Really? Yeah. As the door jingles, a woman strolls into the pawn shop, rocking winter clothes in the summer heat. Now she's chatting with Les, teasing him about the sweltering weather. She even claims to be a martial arts pro, throwing around Bruce Lee's name. The banter kicks off with a request for a karate move demonstration. She said she was Bruce Lee's sister. Um, so what you got? atmosphere takes an unexpected turn when the woman unveils a unique item, a mysterious fox mink. Less unfamiliar with such creatures engages in a lighthearted conversation to understand more about this fox mink. The woman, with a hint of mystery, reveals her intention to sell it. A mink fox? I don't know. I don't, I'm not a into animals. Um, I've heard of fox. I've heard of mink. Um, so fox mink. Did you want to pause? The conversation unfolds. Les dives into the details of the fox mink, trying to grasp its worth. The woman shares anecdotes about the origins of the item, painting a vivid picture of its history. Les, playing the role of the detective, subtly negotiates and gathers information to figure out the best deal. Alex. So, how much did you want for it? 
encounter concluded with the woman deciding to part ways with her fox mate. Les, using his seasoned charm, finalizes the deal. The quirky tale of the winter-dressed woman and her unique pond item adds an unexpected twist to the usual pawn shop routine, leaving both parties with a memorable experience. Woman comes in to sell me a high-end bottle of liquor. Ma'am, I'm Is that what you're saying? You have no respect. When you want when to take the person when they die, fit the liquor inside the bottle. But anytime you're going to belittle a person, Ma'am, I didn't belittle you. As the door chimes, the woman confidently walks in, clutching an empty liquor bottle. She aims for a bold move, attempting to pawn the bottle for a cool hundred bucks. Les, with his discerning eye, swiftly rejects the proposal, explaining that a filled bottle would fetch a better price. The woman, not thrilled with the response, raises her voice, demanding respect and expressing her discontent. I'll give you a hundred dollars. It's not worth more than a hundred bucks. Especially when you say I wouldn't give you a hundred dollars. Don't you ever walk up to my dad. Hey, baby, don't point your fingers. Life after this, man. Don't you dare ever come in here again. In my face. I don't okay. care. You're in my dad's store, and don't you ever think about coming in here you know again. What? Turn your ass badass out the door now. Nowhere actually steps up like a superhero. Now she doesn't just cool things down, she straight up shuts the woman down. With confidence, Ashley tells her to leave and never come back. Suddenly, the chaos turns into quiet thanks to Ashley's quick and firm action. Son of a bitch. Where the hell is he? Rich. He's on the floor. People are waiting to pay us for their merchandise. He's not there. We're losing money. I'd had Rich's back. In the heart of the pawn shop, Les faces a moment of frustration and disbelief. The absence of Rich, a trusted ally for over two decades, leaves Les feeling betrayed. The urgency of customers waiting to make payments adds to the tension, and the weight of loyalty becomes a central theme in this unexpected turn of events. And since the first day he came here, over 20 years ago, I feel betrayed. Didn't I just have an employee meeting? to tell everybody that they need to step up on their game. I'm watching you and Bobby J talk to these two girls. You're there trying to sweet talk them, trying to bull with them. I'm looking for you in layaway. Where the hell are you? I gotta sit in layaway all day long and just wait for something to happen. As the minutes tick away, the atmosphere inside the pawn shop grows more intense. Les reflects on his long-standing support for Rich, highlighting his sense of loyalty that spans a quarter century. He recalls a recent employee meeting where he emphasized the need for everyone to step up their game. Disappointment and frustration seep into his work words as he confronts the situation, a pawn shop mystery intertwined with personal and professional loyalties. I'm watching you and Bobby J talk to these two girls. They're out there trying to sell their jewelry. You're out there trying to sweet talk them, trying to bull with them. They end up walking out the front door. You put me in a position that you were the next to go. In this pivotal moment, Les delivers a stern warning to a fellow employee, Bobby J. The scene unfolds with Les observing interactions and attempts at sweet talking customers. The threat of terminating looms as he recounts the consequences of letting down the team. The dialogue underscores the severity of the situation and the potential impact on job security. Tension rises as Les grapples with the repercussions of the unfolding events. Rich, I'm out. Tell your dad to f off. You f up your job. As the confrontation escalates, Les draws a line in the sand. The ultimatum is clear compliance or termination. The final seconds capture the raw emotion and frustration of a loyal employee who feels unappreciated and misunderstood. He knew he was in trouble once we walked through that door. Joe, what did you steal from me? Tell me the truth. Inside the pawn shop, a sense of trouble looms as the head of security, Joe, faces a difficult moment. The air is heavy with anticipation as accusations are laid out. In a tense exchange, the truth emerges when Joe admits to stealing. The weight of the admission sets the stage for the unraveling of a trusted employee's actions. The detectives call up uniformed officers to put the cuffs on. And then he reaches into his pocket and pulls out an assortment of jewelry worth over $7. $1, As the admission hangs in the air, the situation takes an unexpected turn. Detectives call in uniformed officers to apprehend Joe. A place built on trust is now shaken to its core as the true extent of the betrayal unfolds. You go this way. This is my loyalist point, my 
The arrest unfolds and reality sinks in for the pawn shop owner. The disbelief is evident as a devoted employee, the head of security for the previous three years, is carried away in handcuffs. The emotional weight of the betrayal is clear in the owner's voice, which expresses the anguish of putting trust in someone who later proved dishonest. As the scene unfolds, questions linger in the air. The owner ponders the possibility of Joe working with someone else, leaving the situation shrouded in uncertainty. The aftermath of the betrayal raises concerns about potential accomplices and adds another layer to the unfolding drama. The final seconds leave the audience in suspense, contemplating the true extent of the security guard's actions. Are you her customer or mine? I'm talking to you. Come on. This lady got so irate because she wanted to be next in line. She wanted to be first. She felt that she was the most important out of every customer. You're next in line, so I'm going to be right with you. Okay, well, come on. It doesn't matter. What the f are you? You're not the police. I can talk to whoever the f I want to talk to. How the what are you going to do? You offer it now. In the opening scene, Ashley is at the counter with a lengthy line of customers. A sudden disruption occurs when a black woman attempts to cut in front of everybody else. Ashley confronts her, asking, What are you doing? The woman becomes upset but Ashley firmly asserts you can't do that stuff here goodbye yeah, come right. back here let's talk right now take the receipt. what would you like to do with it ma'am I want to pay well you have to go to those windows I'm not no I come to this line any other time not at this window okay well I'm not gonna stand in the uh, line in the wrong line get in the okay, other line and I'm not gonna get in another line I'm gonna walk straight up to the damn window we won't, we won't take you. the woman continued standing in line at the counter Alessa approached her inquiring about the situation she explained that she wanted to pay but refused to move to the next window. Les informed her that in the pawn shop, crossing others in line isn't allowed, emphasizing the importance of waiting your turn. Of you. Well, you just See this lady here? All the other customers. Okay, and I always come to this one. I'm sorry, you have to stand in the other one. Okay, well, I'll be back before y'all close. You can do whatever you want in this line. She can. Can't wait your turn. We'll be back later. Following the interaction, the woman eventually complied and moved to another window. Les, taking action, instructed the workers at that window not to accept their payment. He firmly directed the woman to wait in line like the other customers, reinforcing the shop's policy on fair and orderly transactions. Thank you, sir. We you know, appreciate no, you. No, no, yo, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, oh, jackass. Take your shit. Bitch. Take your yeah, that's you. And get it to you. you make me. Make we don't, sir, we don't please. Want you can take this stuff. Sir, and sir, put it with listen. The sun, don't shine. Listen. I don't know what the problem was. As the interaction begins, the customer expresses gratitude, but the tone takes an unexpected turn. Tensions rise as the customer's language becomes confrontational. The shopkeeper, addressing the situation calmly, refuses to tolerate mistreatment. The dynamics shift from appreciation to conflict showcasing the challenges of customer service in a brief yet intense moment. Came in here, tried to spend my money, is what I did. That's what I did. Okay. And come, instead of trying to come in here, I'm not even talking to you. I need a, need a liver transplant. Why? Seriously? They didn't even look at these cards. Sour Patch Kids. The narrative unfolds with the arrival of another customer visibly intoxicated. The shopkeeper navigates the encounter with a mix of tolerance and assertiveness. The customer attempts to engage in banter, revealing signs of alcohol influence. The shopkeeper, unswayed, maintains composure and subtly addresses the situation, highlighting the challenges of dealing with individuals under the influence. Not even out of here, sorry, it's not even on here, I'm paying on my. Why? 50 for that shit. Jeff, take him out, please. This better not put his How would you Man. Like Man, what the In this segment, a discussion ensues about cards and a potential liver transplant. The shopkeeper encounters a situation where the customer's intentions are unclear. Misunderstandings arise, and the shopkeeper skillfully navigates the conversation. The dialogue touches on humorous elements while portraying the complexity of communication in a retail setting. You know, I might not make it a new what, is it ma'am? 
Uh, is it? I don't know. You tell me. Man, come on. You the dude with the ponytail? The wife's racking my nuts on the telephone. <laughs> Conscious. Just tie two earrings in your ears. Does it matter? Just take it off, put it with mine a little bit, let it get a little bit more weight to it, and go ahead and give me my okay. money. Does that make sense? Uh, oh, right no. this way. You can't come back. Damn now. this Go out my way and have one of y'all touch me. I don't break this. I'm more than happy to go to the ends of the earth for you. When you come in like an ass, you be walked out like an ass. The scene takes a surprising turn as the atmosphere shifts. The shopkeeper reassures the customers that, despite challenges, the store is dedicated to going the extra mile for them. The encounter, starting with tension, concludes with an assurance of excellent service. This final part encapsulates the roller coaster of emotions within a brief time frame, showcasing the highs and lows of customer interactions. You need some help today? Man, how you doing, brother? What's the deal on this TV here? Uh, this TV right here is uh, $400. $400? Yeah. I was in here two weeks ago, sold you this mother for 90 bucks, and now you gonna ask me 400 for it, man? In the electronics section of the store, a customer named Robert engages in a conversation about a TV with the store employee. The casual tone sets the stage for what seems like a routine interaction. The customer questions the TV's price, sparking a humorous recount of a previous encounter where he claims to have purchased the same TV for a lower price. Are you kidding me? So you're making a $310 profit off me? Bull man. Can I help you? Who are you, man? I come in here two weeks ago, just like I told this gentleman. Do something with your hair, man. And then y'all gonna sell it for $400? You are gonna make that much profit off me? As the dialogue unfolds, the customer expresses dissatisfaction with the marked up price, claiming the store will profit significantly from his purchase. A manager steps in, attempting to resolve the situation. Tensions rise as the customer questions the legitimacy of the price hike and demands a resolution, emphasizing the financial disparity between his purchase and the intended selling price. Brother, where's your receipt? Can you not understand English, my brother? No, I can't. I can't, my brother. I don't believe that he wants a TV for nothing. I'll just take the TV, man. No. The customer threatens to take the TV and leave without making a purchase. The manager issues a stern warning, asserting that any attempt to take the TV without completing the transaction will result in immediate removal from the store. The confrontation takes an assertive turn, with both parties standing their ground. First, I get this TV. Man, get off me. shoe, player. This guy was acting like a total baby. He wanted attention and he got it. Despite the warnings, the customer decides to leave the store, expressing discontent with the entire experience. He accuses the store of mistreatment and vows never to return. The situation concludes with dramatic flair as the customer exits, leaving behind a sense of dissatisfaction and a promise never to return. I'm good, how are you? Oh, well, actually, I'm not doing so good. No? My grandma just passed. I'm sorry. Uh, I was, like, hoping to... Okay, so whose ring is this? My grandma's. Oh. So you want to just pawn it, right? Because you want to be able to get it back? Yeah. Okay. Um, do you have anything else? It's not real. What you mean it's not real? It's not real gold. A guy comes in feeling sad and asked Ashley to pawn his grandma's ring, explaining that she passed away and it's all he has. When Ashley checks the ring, she gently says it's not real. Concerned, she asks if he's got anything else, wanting to help him in a simple way. You saying basically y'all sit up there and waste all the time talking to you? You don't waste your time. If you have a TV, you can pawn your TV. What the f I look like pawning my TV? Do you have a TV? I need to speak with somebody else because you irritate me flat out. It's acting really erratic and it's making me really nervous. No. Lower your voice. Don't Lower your tell voice. me Lower what your to voice. do. Don't Lower put your, your finger in Lower my your face. Your Don't your put voice. your finger. Ashley breaks the news that the ring isn't real. The person gets upset, saying it's not fake. Ashley suggests pawning a TV instead, but he questions why he should. Despite Ashley's efforts, the man gets angrier, repeatedly telling her to lower her voice. Ashley asks him not to point fingers at her face, but he ignores her. I'm trying to help you solve your like issue. Lower your voice. The next thing I know, this guy snapped. Don't tell me what to do. Don't put your finger. 
The security guard intervenes, slamming the upset person to the ground and then dragging him out of the pawn shop. The situation escalates and the guard takes decisive action to maintain order. Next up, we've got this episode where a heavily muscled individual made his way over to meet Les to complain about equipment he got from the store that got busted. Somebody bought this. This piece of junk I bought in here just a couple days ago it don't work now, it's broken. What is it? A little ab lounger I bought here, man, workout. In the midst of the pawn shop's hustle, a burly customer approaches Les with a complaint. He's upset about a busted piece of exercise equipment, an AV lounger purchased just days ago. Les, sticking to the store policy, explains that they can only provide an exchange, not a cash refund. Tensions rise as the customer vehemently rejects the idea of an exchange, demanding his money back. They can only hand over another item in place of the faulty one. If you had the receipt, I could give you an exchange, I could give you something. I don't want an exchange because it's probably going to be some again. How about you just give my money? As the disagreement escalates, the customer insists on a cash refund, dismissing the option of another item. Les faces a dilemma, stuck between policy and customer satisfaction. The clash intensifies as the customer becomes forceful in his demand for a monetary refund, setting the stage for a heated confrontation. Les could match him word for word without fear. That'd be some money. Or what? Or what? That's gonna be a problem. How about what that? Kind of Les, accompanied by his trusty companion Byron the Snuggle Bear, stands his ground. The customer challenges Les with threats of problems if he doesn't comply. Unfazed, Les maintains his position, asserting that the store's policy is non-negotiable. The air becomes charged with confrontation as both parties refuse to back down. As things got superheated between Les and the customer, Byron tried to step in to calm the man down. As the situation reaches a boiling point, Les and the customer engage in a verbal showdown. The customer grows increasingly forceful and Les warns against physical contact. Byron attempts to mediate and calm the customer, but his intervention takes an unexpected turn, adding a new layer of tension to the already heated exchange. The confrontation takes a risky turn when the customer, ignoring Les's warnings, attempts physical contact. Byron, in a misguided attempt to intervene, escalates the situation further. Les stands firm, refusing to be intimidated while tensions continue to rise. Les questions a man's marriage. Les uses a customer's words against her. There's trouble in the office, but Les reminds Seth that he's the boss. Les kicks off the day questioning a man's marriage, using customers' words against her. Trouble brews in the office, but Les asserts his authority as the boss, teaching a disrespectful man a memorable lesson. Les shows that he's not just a pawnbroker, baby, he's a boss in control. Here are savage Les Gold moments. It looks like Les is more interested in this man's marriage than his business. Les woke up this morning with the urge to roast someone, and of all the people he could roast, he picked this guy. Things take an unexpected turn. Now, in a surprising twist, Les dives into the man's marriage, leaving everybody shocked. Les humorously challenges the man's absurd scenario, roasting him in a way that only Les can. The man's attempt to buy an anniversary present with his wife's jewelry backfires, adding a touch of humor to the pawn shop drama. You get a watch for my wife's anniversary. Oh, it's not your anniversary too? Well, yeah, it is mine too. How many years have you been together? 25 years. Oh, okay. So how many good ones? So how did you get these? Well, we were going through some of her jewelry. She said, this belonged to my grandma. They're not real. Les posts a customer's watch request, questioning the authenticity of the jewelry. Unfazed, Les detects the fake and confronts the customer's peculiar anniversary gift plan. The customer tries to defend himself, but Les, in his signature style, keeps it real and uncovers the truth behind the fake jewelry. Right, hold on a second. How come the old man wants to buy his wife an anniversary present with her own jewelry? That is one hell of a ridiculous scenario. What this man could have done at this moment is leave. But nope, some of these customers love to start drama. This is older than both of us. It probably is. But it was fake when it was made, and it's still fake. I got an Les faces a customer who crosses the line, insulting his family. For the first time, Les takes matters into his own hands, delivering a stern warning. 
The tension rises as Les draws the line, showcasing a side of him that won't tolerate disrespect towards his loved ones. Man, okay, I've seen your wife. Listen, mother. There's two things you don't talk about. What's that? My wife and my family. Oh, okay. so here's the deal. For a moment, we thought. Two of you. Two of you. Here's the deal. Get out of here. Two of you. I'll hurt you guys so bad. Uh -huh. Here you are. Better get the front. Here you are. Two. In a final showdown, Les lays down the law. With no patience left, he kicks the disrespectful customers out, warning them of dire consequences if they return. Les reveals his savage side, making it clear that disrespecting his family won't be tolerated under any circumstances. Hello, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you, sir? That's good. Um, I'm on a pound this TV. I can go 100. Excuse me? So here's a guy who wants 400 hours on a $200 TV. What the f is he thinking? People can help me move my stuff back in my mother's house. 100 is not going to do, sir. I need more than that. But I can't give you more. See, it's a used TV. A young man enters the pawn shop, seeking to pawn a TV for 400 bucks. Les, the owner, declines the initial offer and counteroffers 100 The guy, explaining his need to move back to his mom's house, expresses that $100 won't be sufficient for his situation. You know, I have to get away. You see this? He did this last night. If, what did yeah, he do to you I last night? He beat me up last night. You clearly don't see that. See, you know what? <laughs> you want to cause me to lose my mother temper. I try to give him the benefit of the doubt. I thought he had nice skin. He didn't have any bruises on him. I don't need to call security. You don't need to call him. What the you the guy made up a story about daily abuse from his roommate, seeking empathy to pawn the TV for his escape. Les remained skeptical, noting the absence of visible bruises, praising the boy's clear skin. In response, the boy feeling cornered requests the involvement of security, hinting at a potential dramatic turn of events. What you do? What you from Africa? Oh, okay. Anyway, like I said, can you give me the 400 pages? We sell them for uh, two. Hold on, y'all, y'all. Hey, so much. Sure is. Have a nice day. You. Thank you. You better lucky I'm gonna throw this big mother at you. Where the is my key? Les, trying to find a middle ground, offers $125, but the boy declines and insists on calling the guards. Les, unfazed, reveals the presence of the guard behind the boy. The situation ends with the boy taking the TV and leaving the pawn shop without the need for additional security intervention. Why your fat ass take it off? The f you work here, ain't you getting paid to do this? I look like a butler to you. I don't give a f my f on coming here and get this motherfucker. You better. His big ass gonna beat your little ass, yeah. fat bitch. Give me what army? Motherfucker, come from behind this counter. A tense situation arises as a black woman directs angry shouts at a guard. The guard, responding defensively, questions her, asking if he appears to be a butler in a moment of unexpected confrontation. You get back there. Big ass on my way. Get this speaker and take it outside. You want me to stop? Take the You brought it in. You're gonna take it out. So take it I'm out. I'm not picking that up and taking it outside. Y'all can get your old ass, take out. Your ass out of here. I'm gonna take your bitch ass out of here, y'all. You're not gonna come in threatening my employees. Who gonna bring it outside? Despite Seth's efforts to intervene, the black woman continues her relentless shouting. Even another guard struggles to remove her. Suddenly, she notices Les, the owner, standing behind her. In an unexpected turn, she bursts into laughter and mockingly tells Les to leave. Yo, big ass, you can drive that bitch too, ogre. My big ass, straight ass following behind me. We will give you the respect and the decency you deserve, but when you're threatening my family, we throw you out of here. Taking matters into her own hands, the woman starts leaving, dubbing the guards as Shrek on her way out. The situation takes an unexpected and humorous turn as she adds a touch of sass to her departure. Let's take a look at it. All right. I'm here with my man, and we got in a big argument, and he left me, so I need he to get back home. He left you here? To Hawaii. Oh, really? Where about? Honolulu. Oh, OK. I got a ride from my cousin, so you got to hurry up. There came a woman at Ashley's counter to sell her chain. Now Ashley's looking at her chain to see whether it's worthy enough or not. She's asking Ashley to hurry up as she has to leave earlier as her spouse has left her alone here. Really? Okay. 
How much did you need? I was just trying to not this for you to be nice, but. 600. How about that? I got this from one of my aunts in Africa. This is $600. Oh, do you know what it is? It's actually a Tahitian pearl? No, this yeah. is from Africa. This is an African pearl. Ashley asked her how much she wanted for her jewelry. Now, the woman said $600, which is a lot more than Ashley was willing to spend, since Ashley said that it's not an African stone, but the woman was arguing that it was. $600. My ticket cost $600. That's how much I need. Do you have anything else? No. Excuse me? No. Ashley told her that they're not African pearls, so it's not worth $600, but far less. It was at this point that the woman started acting rude. Ashley got shocked at her stupidity and rude behavior. Eventually, she started behaving really bad as Ashley got angrier. What's going to happen next? 600 or not? You can't get 600 on this. Okay. And also, don't call me a bitch. So you mean to tell me that this ain't worth a mother thing? That's not what I said. It could be worth something. OK, can I get 599 No. Some kind of problem? OK, exactly. can I get $600 or no, not? You can't get anything. Okay, I you get can't talk to her like this. Seven. Get Oh, I can you left you now. Bitch, you don't know why I'm not leaving no my place. Yes, you are. Oh, no, I ain't. Oh, yes, you are. What are you going to do? I'll kiss my Honey, that, you don't have that kind of money. All right, you, all of y'all, bitch. If you want some help, talk to us like a human being. I'm leaving. Aloha. Who the they think they is? them. Which some jewelry for my daughter. Her birthday's in like two weeks. For sure. How old is she gonna be? She's gonna be 12. She's gonna be 12. Yep. Do you want a Kleenex? I've got allergies, man. I itch like super bad. I'm not picking it, I promise. Okay. We have a heart one. It's really pretty. Can I see it? There came a man to Ashley asking for something to buy for his daughter. Now he inferred that she's about 12 years old and he wants something interesting for her. But he's constantly picking his nose, which was making Ashley cringe. He's not stopping from doing such cryptic things, but he's constantly doing it in public. Ashley asked him to let her know if there was something he was interested in buying for his daughter. Look at it. How much you want to spend? Like 100, 150. Please. 75. Can I touch it though? That's bull. I was charging him like $75 on this watch just to give him a deal so he didn't have to touch it with his snotty hands. Can I see the sanitizer for a second? Now, the man selected a watch, but Ashley didn't want him to touch anything with his dirty hands. She asked him about his range, and he said he wants something under 100 bucks, and the watch was 75 The man didn't agree to buy it. Now, Ashley's just getting furious over his silliness. I didn't use sanitizer. Why don't you guys go yourself? I don't even care about the sale anymore. I just want him out of here. Ashley asked him to use sanitizer before touching anything in the shop, but he refused. And this is going to be a very serious problem. They're probably going to have a fight. Ashley got angry and asked him to leave despite no deal. She just wanted him gone. She didn't care for the deal or profit, but just getting him out of the shop. Well, then came the guards who made sure that he left and Ashley used sanitizer everywhere on everything that he put his hands on. Well, that's it for today, everybody. Thanks for being part of the Hardcore Pawn adventure with us. We hope you like the drama and the surprises. Stay tuned for more Pawn Shop stories. See you next time.